think about that, they would be really excited about it. That's really cool. <laughs> And I'm looking sideways, Laura, because I'm trying to pull up YouTube yep. so I can keep a track of comments. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I would also encourage you all to do, like, as we're, like we're, do, we're modeling things that business analysts do here, like, oh, I'm looking sideways because that's what's here. And I have my paper because I like to take notes. Like some of these things are things that you wouldn't think to externalize um, in a normal face-to-face -face setting, uh, but are really important in a virtual setting. So kind of also be just looking at what we're doing as we're running a virtual session like this um, as some examples of things that might uh, work for you as well. <laughs> All right, so we should be live on YouTube, it looks like, um, and it's right at the top of the hour. So should we go ahead and jump in? Um, I think we're, let me just put this back to everybody. Okay. Uh, and if you could just confirm for me that you can still see, see my title slide, um, you should see welcome, see welcome to the coaching session um, and strategies for effectively working from home as a business analyst. Perfect. All right. We're good to go. All right. Well, thank you all for being here and joining us. And uh, I'm here today with Disha Trevetti from Bridging the Gap, who also has a ton of work from home experience as a business analyst. So I'm Laura Brandenburg, and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Bridging the Gap. I've done some work at home as a business analyst consultant very early in my career, or early like in the evolution of my business. Uh, most of my experience when I was a full-time business analyst was mostly in the office. Um, I would have work from home days, but I did a lot of consulting remotely, and our entire team at Bridging the Gap is remote now. So we have people who have never met each other face-to-face. Um, I, I have met almost everyone to face to face, but there's a, still a couple of instructors that I've hired and hired remotely and haven't met face to face and most of them have not met together face to face. Maybe we've run into each other at conferences, but we don't see each other in person on a regular basis. So we have all that experience to bring as well. Um, and just if you don't know a lot about Bridging the Gap, we are an online training company. We hope it focus on helping you build your skills as business analysts and all of our training is available online, uh, which, you know, so we've been in this online space for a long time before it's become um, kind of a, a need at this point. Uh, and Disha, can you tell us a little bit maybe about yourself and also your, your experience working from home? I know you've been doing it for at least a yes. couple of years. Now, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I have actually been working uh, remotely for almost seven and a half years. Um, so I have, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing what I have learned and experienced over these years. Um, as Laura already mentioned, I'm part of BTG, excited to be here. And um, I'm currently, my, yeah, my current assignment is also working remotely. So uh, yeah. looking forward to sharing everything with you guys. Yeah. And can you share just a little bit about your current assignment? Because seven and a half years, that's a, that's a long time. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes. Yeah, so I actually um, started working from home with my, um, when my first daughter was born and we had moved to Northern Virginia. We used to be in Florida before, and that's where my parent company was. Um, so because I was going to move, I started working from home and then um, I decided to take a short break. And with the next assignment, I was also able to negotiate a work from home. So um, so my first my first work from home assignment was about three and a half, four years. And then this one has been going on for three years now. Okay. That's yes. awesome. So you've got a ton of experience working with new teams, getting up yes. to speed, um, making the transition. And I'm really excited to hear what you have to share with us today. Too. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, so just a couple of like kind of what we're going to be covering today. Um, you know, this session is going to be relatively informal compared to maybe what you might have seen in some of our webinars in the past. Like we've gone from idea to being here live with you in two business days. Um, and we both also have kids home from school. So as I mentioned, like my kids seem to be having a party upstairs. So you may hear some banging. Um, uh, that's just part of the drill, as someone said. There will be a replay. We are gonna be posting the replay along with some supplemental resources uh, after the session. Um, and I will just like warn you because we did put this together pretty quickly and we wanted to focus on getting the information out. Like we don't have super pretty slides, but we do wanna focus sharing what we can to help you success, be successful right away. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge our Circle of Success coaching 
um, clients or participants in that program because we had a coaching session last Thursday that really like they brought this up as a concern and they also had a lot to share with each other around that. Uh, and that was really what was the catalyst for me of this idea of doing something with the broader community as well, uh, because it really helped me realize how big of a, a topic it was for people. Um, and I just want to acknowledge as well that Dish is preparing to do an in-person talk on this topic and had started that preparation even before all of these events unfolded. So I'm really grateful to have her here, both for her experience and the fact that she's thought already thought about thought leadership in this in this area. Um, and the final thing I want to say is the reason we're doing it on Zoom, even though we've maxed out 100 participant limit, so you might be at this point listening on our YouTube channel, and Dish is going to be monitoring YouTube. I'm going to be monitoring comments on Zoom, so we'll try to keep comments from both of those platforms that we can. But the reason we wanted to do it on a platform like this is because there's a lot of wisdom in communities like this. So. I'll be asking a few times for you to share your resources. Like, what are you doing to help keep your kids busy and things like that. Um, so chiming in via the chat is a great way to share your ideas with others. Um, and kind of there's a big mindset piece behind that as well, because in challenging times like this, you know, it can really invoke our scarcity mindset, this sense of, you know, I don't have enough. Right. I don't have anything to give. I can't. I, I'm I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. Right. And so just reaching out to give any single little piece that you can any bit of wisdom um, is and can be a huge value add. So even if you're listening to the replay and you have an idea like put that in the YouTube chat um, and we'll probably be sharing the chat. Um, with the replay on Zoom, or at least compiling the resources that get shared. Uh, but that's just one of those ways that you can practice your abundant mindset because we all have something to give. Um, and if you do have a specific question, please type question before it because I envision the chat will get kind of a little bit crazy and that'll help us pull out what are the questions versus where are you sharing resources with each other, okay? All right, and here's what we're planning to cover today. We want to talk about how do you set yourself up for success. So if this is new, like, and we did a little bit of a check in before, but yeah, let us know, like, is this something that's completely new for you now that we've kind of had more people join? Like, are you, you know, setting yourself up to work from home for the first time and not having done this in a consistent way before? Um, because I think that's like just getting that set up in place is a really big piece. Um, and then another thing is that we're going to talk about is some of the practical like communication strategies for communicating virtually with teams. It's so important as BAs communication. So how do I elicit requirements? How do I validate requirements? How do I brainstorm? And we'll talk about some strategies for doing that in a remote environment. Um, and then also I want to talk about protecting your mindset, especially in where we are now with everything going on with the coronavirus. It's like there's so much uncertainty and working from home is just like another layer of certainty, uncertainty, right? And so I want to talk about some of the strategies for protecting your mindset in these times. And of course, we want to answer as many questions as we can as well. Okay. So before we jump in, and Dish is going to share some specifics around um, the getting yourself set up for success. I see a lot of people in the chat saying first time. Um, you know, I want to just kind of offer you a shift in or a reframe for what to be thinking about in this time, because I just went into like, this is a challenging time. We have to protect our mindset, right? And it's so easy to see the problems and the challenges that are in front of us right now. Um, and that uncertainty can be really debilitating. It can put us into fear. It can put us into constraint, into, into scarcity. Um, I truly do believe that in every challenge, there is an opportunity. So, but to see the opportunity, we have to be willing to step away from the fear, from the worry and from the doubt and open ourselves up to the opportunities all about us. Uh, all around us. And I will say like over the past four days, I've had this like constraint feeling and like, and then I, I like for a moment, I'll be like, Laura, that's not serving you. Right. And I'll start to, and I'm like, Oh wait, there's some, 
there's some like fantastic things that could come out of this. And so it is a practice and it's not easy, um, but it is really important to start thinking of what opportunities is this creating for my organization, for me personally in my career. Um, one thing that Jamie Moore shared, she's one of our blueprint participants and Circle of Success members, she shared it in our blueprint, is that like thinking about how this situation could ex could expand how employers accept work from home practices. I saw somebody else post about like employers or managers are going to have to learn how to trust us, right, when we're working from home. And so it can shift our relationships in a positive way. Um, I also think that as business analysts, it's a huge opportunity to step up as leaders um, to show how we can work effectively remotely. And I think our businesses and our organizations need us now more than ever because we're the glue that keeps everybody communicating. And that's so, so essential. So if you've been wondering like, where do I fit in this circumstance or like in, in the environment, I think your role is gonna become even more important over the next several weeks as we figure out collectively how to do this together. Um, and also helping our businesses just make important decisions about where to focus their efforts, what is actually important, what will put your business ahead of the game when kind of everything settles out in the, over the next few months, because we're going to have a rough few months and then things will settle out and there will be companies that are thriving at the end of that. And there will be companies that didn't respond and maybe have some scaling back to do. So how can your business not just survive, but also thrive um, in the coming days, months, weeks, years? Okay. Um, and then finally, um, it's also a time to be grateful. So the fact that we can work from home is, an, and is a huge blessing. Um, when you think about what's going on in the world, there are so many people who are, you know, in jobs where working from home is impossible. They are either forced to come into work um, where they might be exposed to things that could be detrimental to them or their families, or they're being sent home without pay. Uh, because they're in retail and their employers can't afford to pay them. So we as a profession, I think, are in an immense place of privilege to have this opportunity to do the work that we can do safely from our own homes. And when we get like all, when we get in our head about how different it is, I think that just helps bring it back to like, how grateful can I be that I get to do this, um, to be able to care for my children, even if they're running around upstairs and to choose to self-isolate during this time. So it's a, it's a immense thing to be grateful for as well. Just anything you wanna to add to those two comments before we jump into kind of some of the practical stuff that we wanted to cover? Um, just that, Laura, it, that's, that's, those are all very good points. And it's so important to have that mindset, to be cognizant of that mindset and to, hold it and come back to it yes. every time you kind of go away from it because yes. um, it's, it's not tangible, but it's something so important to the, to the success yes. of working remotely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, and, I, and just to reiterate, like, don't, if you haven't been thinking like this, don't be like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me, right? <laughs> like I've been in the same space over the last few days for sure. Like there's been some really down times where I'm, what is going on? What is this gonna mean for our business? How is this gonna affect things? And it's okay to have those thoughts too. Yeah, and the um, constant- and then bring yourself back, like Disha said. <laughs> yes, yeah, the yeah. constant influx of news doesn't help either, right? <laughs> no. All right, so Disha, do you wanna talk a little bit about setting yourself up for success? Absolutely. Um, yes, Laura. Um, one of the things that I want to start off with is this profession, right? Business analysis. When, mm -hmm. I, when I started working remotely uh, and when I brought up this um, arrangement to my manager, I myself had few doubts in my mind because as business analysts, we, we interact so much with other, other people in the organization and there is just, there's just so much, um, so much that happens, you know, when you're co-located, right? That it was hard for me to imagine that we can be successful as BAs, even, even, even though we are not in the same location as our as our stakeholders, clients, customers. Um, but it's it has been wonderful to see that this is possible, and um, I want to share some of the key steps that I think. Um, we should have in place 
to ensure continued productivity. Um, so the first first thing being workspace, right? Um, it's it's very important to have a dedicated workspace. It could be your desk. Unless there is a um, there is a space constraint, like a serious space constraint, I would I would strongly advise against working from bed or dining table because um, I think it's just a matter of you know forming those boundaries and keeping them. So have a dedicated workspace, and um, and it will it will make things a lot more easier because that's where you would have everything um, everything set up all your nook all your notes and um, and your um, your headset and and everything right so have a dedicated workspace it's it's it seems like a simple step but it's it's important um, and have, even in a temper even if it's temporary like yes being a temporary table um, we've had places where we were you know working in houses we weren't going to live in for a long time that we didn't have, like, I didn't have an official desk, but I had like a plastic table <laughs> that was in my bedroom in a corner. Right. So right. it's like, it, at least that was my space that I could go and, and work in. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah. So yeah. Um, like having a dedicated place where, where you, you see that as your workspace, I think that's important to have yeah. um, additional things like dual monitors and somebody, I saw there was a message about, um, headset right like noise cancelling headphones um things like that uh, will be very helpful um you know as you stay on conference calls depending on you know what your work actually requires but having those technological aspects in place uh, would be would be very helpful and of course a comfortable chair because you'll be sitting here for long hours with my first work assignment we used to be on conference calls back to back from like really early morning um, to like afternoon. So um, having a space where you can comfortably work from is uh, is, is helpful. Yeah. Um, work hours and breaks, right? Um, try to maintain the same, de define work hours and then try to maintain that work, work period. Um, it might be different depending on the project that you're working on. Like uh, when I look back, with my first remote assignment, I used to be glued to my chair from eight to five because that is what I used to get. I used to get a head start early in the morning. And then after that, we would have calls and stuff. And so I used to be in my space from eight to five. Then with, with another project where the team was much more globally dispersed, we used to have the majority of the meetings from really early hours. Like I've had meetings at 5 a.m. Eastern uh, time. So we would start at five and then all the conference calls would be done around 1130 or 12. And then I would take a short break and come back and, and work some more. So basically your work hours can, can vary. So, uh, but once you recognize that these are your work hours, try to limit the work in that time period, because otherwise you will be working, um, you know, during dinner time or the, the time basically that you should be spending with your family. So be cognizant um, of, of that. And breaks are very important. Breaks look different when you're working remotely, right? Um, but like Laura was saying, this can be a blessing in disguise because you can use your break to get your workout done. You can run a quick errand, um, take a, yeah. And of course, the, the coffee breaks and the water breaks, right? They are very important. Dance breaks. I like to do dance breaks like once an <laughs> hour. Like that's... <laughs> <laughs> I've not done that. Moving. Maybe I <laughs> absolutely. It's like whatever keeps you going because when you're working remotely, it will mostly be you. And um, okay, so for example, right now um, I don't have a lot of meetings, which means I don't have a lot of interaction um, that I usually used to. So when you're working remotely, you're working by yourself, um, and these days working in um in the co-space what are those called laura where you where you they're especially oh, yeah, for remote yeah. workers like for pods yes pods yeah. are um they're, they're basically spaces that are rented out to people who work remotely so that they can they can they can work from there um for multiple reasons right but um we don't have that right now but if you're working um in, in an office and if you don't have anybody to chat to it can become pretty um it can it can impact 
impact your motivation and your and your productivity, right? So it's better to take breaks um, depending on whether you need some physical movement, some some more stimulation, mental stimulation. So so use your breaks accordingly. And I've also used timers because I would forget to take a break. So use a timer so that you remember that you have to get up from your desk and go get a glass of water or do do whatever. But but incorporate breaks because that is what will keep the healthy balance and will keep you going. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next comes support. And what uh, what I mean by that, um, Laura mentioned that like, you know, a lot of you might have kids or you might be taking care of loved ones, right? Um, and um, it, is, it is better to understand what kind of um, expectations they should have and what your boundaries are. So for example, when it comes to kids, like my husband and I, we, we know that I will be working these hours. And so he will be the go-to person. And then um, a certain hours of the day, um, it'll be vice versa, right? So it's important for us to communicate that to our family. So they know, because they cannot look at our outlook. They don't know when we have meetings and how are days going. So make sure you do that communication with your family because it's important for them to have um, that transparency so they know when they can count on you and when you will be not available. So have that yeah. communication. Um, as I will also say that, you know, you can also include your kids in this. Like my older daughter is almost eight now. And um, when I tell her that I'll be gone for this much time, like she won't come knocking on my knocking on my door or we have this place where, you know, she can leave me messages. So as soon as I'm done, I'll know that I need to go find her and, you know, we'll okay. figure things out, but keep that communication going. Um, connectivity. So that is like the backbone of working remotely, right? So make sure you are on a good internet. If necessary, um, you know, have, all the numbers for your internet provider. There used to be time where Comcast was on my speed dial. <laughs> it's yeah, I it it was a difficult time. I, I I was calling them like every three days. There was something wrong with connectivity where I was. Like we had the best internet that was available. This was eight years back, um, but we used to have issues. So um, yeah, have have that information. Um, also, um, be aware of the Outlook. Um, web access link, right? So if you're not able to VPN, then you can you can at least get to your your emails. Um, I also keep keep a list of important phone numbers and email addresses because in case if I'm not even able to get to my Outlook, then I can at least you know communicate with that person. So have that um, handy list of important phone numbers and emails, um, and also know how to use hotspot on your phone so that. You know, if need be, then you can you can still have some connectivity. Um, what else? Um, and I will offline. just add to that, like this, if you don't have great internet um, and you can upgrade, like this would be the time to do it, right? Like it just adds yeah. this huge layer of frustration. Like yeah. where we lived in Colorado, we were just in an area that, I mean, we were paying, we had three different internet services, like, because my husband works, had worked, like, does software development remotely, and which is, adds another layer, and it was just such an area where we needed that, because one would go down, or they were all slow, and, um, and it was still a pain, right, and I, I remember it, like, it slowed down my videos, and I could, like, there were things that we had to stop doing, because they were just hard, yeah. And so like, this is something to think about investing in. Um, and somebody made a great point. You might be able to get your employer to help with the costs as well. Um, yeah. But also think about your own sanity. And if you can save yourself a couple of hours of time and actually shorten your workday a little bit based on having that connectivity, um, it, I think it's just a really important investment to be thinking about if you need it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, absolutely, yeah. And the last thing that I was going to add to um, to that was offline documents. Um, you know, leverage leverage that functionality where, um, as and when you can, um, have that have those important documents available to you offline, so you can work work with things. Yeah. Um, the next one, I'm ready for the next one, Laura. Priorities, and by priorities, I mean both the organizational priorities and also your own priorities. So with organizational priorities, make sure you're checking in with your with your manager to know um, 
to know what you're supposed to be working on. If you're working on multiple, if you have multiple things on your plate, then um, have a frequent um, communication with them to make sure that you're still working on the most important um, urgent thing. I have also done things like um, just sending them an email at the end of the day saying that this is what I worked on today and this is what I'm working, this is what I'm planning to work on tomorrow. Um, that's that, that that's helpful because you know then then they know what you're working on and if you need to change direction then they will be able to guide you and as the situation with the coronavirus evolves things are things are changing so just have frequent communication with your with your manager to to know what you should be working on um, and in terms of your own priorities not all days are going to be different uh, depending on even if you're working with the same firm your your projects might need something different from you so just know that what your priority is for the day having consciously thought about that will help you maintain the balance between work and uh, work and personal life um, and just just maintaining that boundary uh, will will help with the with the overall balance because it's it's very easy um it's very it's very easy and it's also very um convenient to just open up your work laptop like you know after dinner is done thinking that you you'll get some work done because you're still thinking about that problem and that is where i think it connects to having a physical a dedicated phys physical space where you work because then you associate your your work with that and um, th there is nothing wrong in you know working extra hour or extra time uh, once in a while. But when we don't consciously manage our time, then it just gets messy, right? So, um, so I think knowing the priorities and just just doing that mental check helps put so many things in perspective. Um, that is everything yeah, that I have. Yeah, those are some great suggestions, Disha. Um, and there's some good suggestions filtering in through too about like making sure that you understand your organization's policies for sure. Um, you don't want to be pulling sensitive information down that you, you can't. But um, um, definitely like in a lot of environments, I think we have more flexibility about these things that we might give ourselves credit for. Um, I'm interested if anybody has any questions specifically about setting yourself up for success. Um, and while you might be typing those in, again, put question ahead of your chat, either on the YouTube stream or in Zoom, and we'll try to answer a couple of questions. But I want to address the elephant in the room, like what if your kids are home? And Disha has, has shared a few tips on this already, um, because both Disha and I have young children at home. Uh, my daughters are eight and five, and you said yours are seven and four, right? Is it a little bit... Um, uh, I, I can't hear you now, Disha, but um, yeah, so we both have two younger daughters at home as well. Um, so we're, we're figuring this out with you. Um, I think what Disha said about like collaborating with your partner is key. If you have a partner who's also from home, know who is in charge at various times. Um, and then thinking ahead, like in this first week, we're all trying to like I'm trying to readjust. So like, you know, like we're, we're figuring it out day to day based on the things we already had scheduled that we can't move or don't need to move. Um, but I think as the weeks unfold, we'll be probably a little bit more structured about that and decide who's in the morning and who's in the afternoon or kind of figure out a schedule that's similar day to day. Um, that's what we've done in the past when we knew we were moving to a situation where we didn't have childcare for a month or two. Um, and we had a structured way of organizing the day or the week so that it was similar and we kind of got into a pattern. Um, I also think that, you know, just giving yourself a little bit of grace with your children, um, you know, you might have them watching more technology or shows than you normally would and like allowing that to be okay, unless you're totally, totally opposed to it. But I think we have to all give ourselves grace in some of these times. Um, and allow ourselves to bend our rules a little bit. Um, and one of the things that's been working well for me, it's always like, you know, things are so fun when they're first starting, but like incorporating kids into activities that they 
really can be a part of. So like yesterday I did my workout and I had this workout from my trainer, uh, Una Duncan, that actually specifically involved kids, right? So like, instead of needing my focus time to do my workout, I could get my workout done in a time that was also connecting with my kids so that they felt that I was present in their life. And then they kind of went back to their self play after that. Right. So it allowed, it, it just allowed for a more fluidity in the day. Um, and today we all did chores together and, you know, we started talking about like, what do we need to do to keep the house clean now that we don't have somebody coming to clean the house because we're really doing our best to self isolate as well. Um, and how can we be involved in that together and meal prep and so involving kids in some of those things, um, in a fun way, it all is about your attitude. I found like the way I presented it this morning just like landed with them and we all like, got started with cleaning and it was really good. Um, but finding ways to connect with kids around those things so that when you do have your work time, you don't feel like, and then I also need my time to meal prep and I also need my time to clean, right? Like you can have that dedicated time to be dedicated time for your work. Yeah, and I would also say Laura that for for kids who are not used to seeing uh, their parents working from home, I think this is an opportunity for us to be role models to them, to show them how dedicated we are to our work. And yeah. just like being with them is a priority, working is, is an equal priority. And so I think it's it's an excellent opportunity for us to showcase some of these things to our, to our kids. I think that's a great point because I, I still have it sometimes spinning in the back of my head, like feeling guilty about working. Right. And it's <laughs> actually like, I want my, I want my daughters to feel great about working and realize that they also have something important to contribute to the world. Um, and so we're modeling that. That's a beautiful, beautiful comment. Tisha. Thank you. Um, all right. So G Baker asked what obligations does everyone think um, have employers have to let me see, employers have to employees and supporting them and working from home when the employer is saying we need to work from home, should the company be willing to pay for a new furniture, internet service equipment, et cetera? Maybe to a broader question, but it's on my mind as a BA manager. That's a great question. I'd be interested to hear other people's responses to it too. I think, you know, like, I think there's an answer to that question if work from home becomes the norm two or three months from now. And there's like an answer to that question now. I think now we all like there's a sense of like we're all in this as a collective right and we have to also give our employers grace that they're trying to figure things out on the fly and I can say that as a business owner it feels like every day I need to reevaluate every key decision in my business about how we're delivering our programs and how we're taking care of our customers how we're taking care of our team based on how things are unfolding and it's really difficult to even look two or three weeks ahead and then imagine what the scenario is going to be. So like using your own furniture, using your own internet, using the resources you have to continue to add value to your employer, I think is an important perspective to take. But that doesn't mean that like if working from home becomes the norm that you should continue to be doing that, right? Like there, I think there is a, there is definitely a cost savings that employers experience when they have employees working from home. Uh, and so kind of to, to compensate employees in some ways is definitely a fair thing to ask. Uh, but I think at this point, I think we all should just be looking at how can we contribute and work together to help our business come through this successfully versus um, necessarily needing to be compensated for every little thing that comes up um, as we go through this transition. Okay, but it's a great question. Um, yeah, so same question from Kemi. Yeah. Okay, Let's see. And just a reminder, if you have a question, put question in front so that I can call it out. All right, I think we're good here. I want to make sure we get to touch on all these topics. So let's, um, let's move ahead to some of the strategies for communicating because this is, this is what we do, right? This is how we continue to add value each and, and every day. Um, based on, you know, these new, this new environment. So one of the biggest ones I think is just to be proactive. So where things in a in-person office setting might have just materialized, like you happen to see the right person in the hallway, or you were in a meeting and you talked before, you talked afterwards, right? Like those things are, are less likely to happen in a remote environment. 
And so you need to be more proactive in your communication. Um, so reaching out to people that you might typically, you know, happen to see, um, this includes your teammates, your management, your stakeholders, you know, planning in some one-on-one -on -one connections, whether that's a phone call or chats, like you might have a list of people that you just like, did I connect with this person today in some way? And like at the end of the day, reach out to the ones that you haven't connected with. But definitely being more proactive about your communication is important because I saw a lot of concerns coming up about like, you know, the info, like the just knowing what needs to be done based on kind of the, the body language or what's happening. And some of that is just being more proactive about asking more questions. Um, and also realizing like this situation is new to everyone. So nobody's gonna have the perfect answer and nobody's going to necessarily feel comfortable with what they're doing. So if you can take the leadership role and actually be reaching out to people that'll help them be more comfortable too. Uh, and it might even be reaching out to people now to be like, we're gonna be having like our meeting on Zoom on Thursday, right? Like, how do you feel about that? Are you ready to share a video? How can I best support you? Um, you know, we know this is new for everyone. You might have some of those one-on-ones to kind of get ready for that. And that's something that you, know, you might often do when you start a new project, having one-on-ones with everyone, kind of coming back to that, that practice, um, because now we've changed everything could also be a really good, good idea. Um, setting expectations for meetings. So being clear, are people expected to share video or are they not? Right, and just setting that expectation, putting it in your agenda that you send out or in the meeting notes that you send out. Um, what's your company policy on that? What's your team policy on that? Maybe having a, a, a discussion about, it, is it adding value for everybody to share a video or is it not adding value? Um, it could be that the connectivity issues are so bad that it's like slowing everything down and it's better to just have everyone on a conference call, but just you know, being clear what your expectations are for the meeting. Um, going over the agenda, this is basic meetings like you would do in person, but go over the agenda, let them know what you expect from the meeting, how you want them to engage. You know, did you notice what I did at the beginning of this session? I said, please like share your comments and chat and the chat is off the hook of people making suggestions to each other, right? So do you want people doing that in your meeting or do you want them just focused on the actual discussion? So just set those expectations for people. And I do think also, planning aspects of your meeting where you can individually call on each person for input. So if you have five people in your meeting, maybe there's a few times where you say, I wanna hear from so like each person individually, even if it's just like, you know, I have nothing to add, but that a lot set that expectation in advance so that they know that it's coming and then follow through on that, um, which also can help you. A lot, a lot of the concerns I've seen are about like, how do I, how do I like, I can't read people's body language, like especially if you're not on video um, and specifically asking for their input and letting them know that you'll be asking for their input, put some responsibility on them to provide some input as well. Um, using visuals and demos. So if you can screen share, that is ideal, right? Preparing a visual like a wireframe or a flow chart or a data model or any sort of picture that can show that thing. Um, and then if you can write on it using screen sharing technology, like you would on a whiteboard, that's ideal. But if you can't, at least sharing it in advance so that everybody has the same reference point um, to be using as well. Um, demos are great for having somebody show you a process, just like you are like looking over their shoulder, if you can do that as well. Uh, active listening is way more important. It's another way that you can substitute for the fact that you can't see, see people's body language as easily. So what active listening is, is, is basically reflecting back what you've heard or what you've understood. So if somebody has kind of said things for a few minutes, like you might say, what I'm hearing is this and summarize that. And then also related to this being really clear on what your next steps are. So what I'm hearing is this and what my next steps are is are this. Um, and then like, do you have any concerns, right? Or would you have any feedback on that? Or did I get this right, right? So you're creating um, the buy-in process verbally when you can't use body language to just kind of informally be, oh, that person's okay with this. 
Um, it's actually a great process for getting buy-in and confirmation on requirements anyways, and something that you can apply in your in-person meetings when you get back to in-person meetings, uh, but definitely like more consciously than ever, making sure that you're actually asking for confirmation reflecting back what you heard. Um, another way of active listening is to actually be taking notes on the screen if you can screen share. So like there's times in our team meetings where I'll start to update a document based on people's input. Uh, and, and then so everybody can see they're having this sort of input and then here's the adjustment we're making as a result. Okay, um, and then regular communication. So with your managers be thinking like, is a daily status report a good idea? How do I check in with my team members on a regular basis? Um, a VA manager mentioned they were on the phone. So what, what would be a valuable check-in for you to have? So there's this risk of being, like I think as an individual, we can't err, err on over communicating, especially to our management. From a management perspective, like asking people to focus on what's essential, right? Like what, what issues do they have? I saw that come in the chat. Uh, where are they getting stopped? How can you help them? What did they accomplish today? Uh, in our Circle of Success coaching program, we do a, a win sharing channel in our Slack channel. And um, it's a big, I think that's a big piece of that you might think of as a manager too, is like, how can people celebrate a work related win with you every day? So it's less about checking in to make sure like everything got accomplished, but like, look at what I accomplished today and having that sense of success and that sense of win that people really need when they're working from home. Okay, Dish, anything you wanna to add to anything I just covered here? Um, I'll, I'll add something about just communication in general. So um, I, be mindful of the, the kind of communication channel you choose. So um, in office, if you might have, just used an email. And if you're sending out something that is that is urgent, then it might be okay to follow up that email with a phone call. Yeah. Um, just, just a sample scenario, right? But um, I think it's important to understand what channel of communication to use and also not to overdo it, right? You don't want to send them an IM, an email and a phone call. Yeah. Um, so. So choose the right method of communication at the yeah, right yeah, level right. of detail. Yeah. And there is a question here from Francis. What chat tools do you have that work for you that you may not have used before? Um, do you have chat tools that you use in your work? Um, not right now. We used to, um, uh, no, not, not right now. Okay. I'm not using anything. However, um, um, we are using Slack, right? Mm -hmm. And then there is MS Team, which is uh, which is also used as a good medium. Um, yeah, that would be a great I have one, one more name that people are using too. Yeah, yeah, I have one more name that's escaping me. Um, but a lot of a lot of firms, even without remote work, I mean, they already have these chat tools in place, right? That that yeah. everybody uses. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Did we have any questions come in around this through YouTube? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so there was one from Satyam um, and he asks that what if all your projects are on hold and don't have any work, how can we support organization and continue to add value and be proactive? Um, do you wanna take that Laura? Or? Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really interesting scenario. I would look at where is, where is the energy flowing in your organization? So, if there is like a response, so there's there's two areas I would like. Is there where is the energy flowing in your organization to either deal with effects of what's happening or or anything, and then look volunteer yourself to get involved in those initiatives, especially if they've increased in priority, right? And it that might mean taking on a different kind of role in in the organization. It might mean more of a communicator or coordinator or project management type role. Um, crisis management type role, right? So just look at, well, if we're not doing our project work, which is an understandable response because we're diverting our resources in another way, how can you get into that flow of work? Um, and the second thing I would suggest is looking at foundational work. So this is a great time to look at what are the business analysis processes that you're doing? 
Um, how effective are they looking and, you know, all the stuff that you always like, oh, if we ever had time, I would like do retrospectives on all my projects and I would look at this data and I, you know, all that, like if I ever had time, I would do stuff like just sit out and brainstorm a list of it and start to, to chip away at some of that and let your management know what you're doing and what you're focusing on why. Um, training can also be a great, it could be a great time to go through that course that you've never gone through or um, do some learning and professional development, but like choose to do something that will put your organization and your team and you, you yourself personally and professionally ahead when the project work picks back up. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times we have an idea of what's coming up next. So even though things are not 100% in motion, for that project, you can you can still you know just begin to do some research or or some learning that might that might be required, like Laura said. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this question had come in through our Facebook group. I feel like we've probably addressed it um, uh, to a certain extent, but from for processes specifically, this is where you know prepare a process flow diagram, um, share that with stakeholders. Uh, you can also build the process flow diagram on the fly. So the same way you would do it on a whiteboard, right? Here's my starts, here's my end. Let's start putting the boxes in between. You could create even just a skeleton ahead of time. So you could start to type things in uh, and not get too like caught up in the technology. Uh, but yeah, you definitely can do di discovery and analysis of the current state and the to be state sharing a screen through Zoom. Uh, and you just wanna think about what's the best thing that you need to prepare in advance to make that meeting more effective. Um, I always say for any kind of meeting, like you should probably be spending two to three times as much time preparing for and digesting the information from the meeting as you off spend actually in the meeting, right? So that might even be a bigger number as you're getting used to the, the online environment. So how can I best structure this agenda? What, what's my true goal to get out of this meeting? What, what can I prepare in advance that will help me effectively facilitate this meeting and help stakeholders have the aha moments in the meeting and share what they need to? Um, and then also just as always setting the expectation like, okay, now that I have this, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna analyze and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna have more questions, right? But so I'm accepting that it will be an iterative process and the first few times you might not feel like you get quite as much done as you would have gotten done in person. And then I think it will level out as you get used to the new, the new way of doing things. Okay. Anything on that one before we move on, Disha? Uh, no, I'm, I was actually thinking about the, the communication tools and I'm trying to remember Microsoft has uh, a tool and I'm trying to remember the name for that one, uh, but we also use Skype. Yeah, um, that's yeah. And it looks like there's a ton in the chat. So that's awesome. <laughs> okay, very cool. All right. So let's talk about protecting your mindset too, because mindset is so incredibly important, um, not partly in remote work, but also just in stressful times like these. So one of the things that I've become aware of is that Stress actually increases the cortisol in your body, which actually weakens your immunity. So I know we're, we're, I'm not a health expert on the coronavirus or anything like that, but I do, I have had personal experience where severe stress caused a lot by external circumstances and my own mindset um, led to a time where I was not my healthiest and best self. And so like, I want you to be thinking about where can I also be taking care of my body and taking care of my mindset because it's essential, not just to delivering value to my employer, it might be essential to thriving health in, from a healthy physical perspective as well. So I'm gonna share some specifics, but I wanna take a minute here and just invite you to take a couple of deep breaths. So feel the weight of the body. So one thing you wanna do, this is, a, this is like an immediate, way to send the signal of safety to your body. And what you do is just feel the weight of your body on the chair, or if you're standing, it can be your feet on the ground. 
but you want to anchor your body in to what, how it is being supported by your physical space. And then you want to take a couple of deep breaths consciously in and out through your nose. Okay. I know I just felt my stress level go down a little bit. I can get a little bit out there in these sessions. And this is something you can do at any time when the day starts to get away from you, or you feel like you have too much to do, or you should be taking a break and you aren't, or your kids are like knocking on your door and you're in the middle of a meeting, right? And just re-signal to your body that you're safe. Um, and it's a very simple, simple exercise to help reduce your stress. Okay. Um, so some additional things to be thinking about is focusing on what you can actually control. So like you get to control how you show up, you get to control the structures that you create for yourself. You get to control what you are going to learn from this organization, right? You can't control how others show up. People are in their fearful childlike selves right now, like our inner child, meaning that younger child that has a lot of fear about everything that's going on, totally justifiable. Many people are acting from that inner child, right? So they're going to say things they don't really mean. They're going to um, verbalize and externalize their stress. You might have this happening with stakeholders. It might be happening in your company, right? You can't control any of that. You can control how you respond and how you choose to show up and the boundaries you put in place to protect yourself. Um, so focusing on what you can control, and this means like eliminating some of the resentment or the fear around things that you can't control that are literally out there and giving yourself permission to do that. Um, focusing on the value you create. This is especially, I think it's important for all of us because we feel like we're not in the office. Are we actually like working enough hours, right? It is not about the hours that you put in. It is about the value that you're creating for your employer. And it's especially true for those of you who have like additional responsibilities during this time. Um, you know, if you can get done in four hours, what you would normally get done in eight, like, and be moving your projects forward, like allowing that to be okay. Um, and I know not all employers are going to be like wanting to hear that message, but I think, uh, I think it's really important to be focusing on your, your value. Uh, in the circle of success, we actually have this concept called Einstein time, where time just shows up for you sometimes. Like you go to do something and a colleague's already done it, or you find a template that's perfect, or you find an example from the past that gets you 80% there. Um, an example of that is how we did very simple slides for this presentation, because I was like, what is the way that we can show up and serve without overwhelming and overstressing ourselves? And I was like, well, I can take the outline I created and I can put it in a slide deck and we can speak to it and we can share ourselves on video, right? And so in a, a presentation that might've normally taken me, like I might've spent a couple of days on, I did in an hour and a half. And so that is a way of Einstein time showing up for you uh, or in time showing up for you. So it starts with just believing that there's more than enough time for everything that you need to accomplish. And then just going through your day, expecting things to happen and flow for you in a, in a specific way. Um, and it starts also with like work, being more concerned about creating the value or accomplishing an objective than mm -hmm. like logging in a certain amount of hours in at the desk. Um, Isolation, I think, is a big one as well, um, and really be thinking about how can you connect with people authentically, especially if you're an extrovert. Like, I, we're a family of introverts, so like, quite honestly, like, we self-isolate half the time on the weekends, anyways. Like, I'm sure there'll be a point about a week from now where we're like, oh, we're ready to get out of the house, but like, I don't mind not getting out of the house all that much. But I know for some of you, it could be a very different feeling of like, I'm used to being out with people. I like to be out with people. I'm a connector. I'm an extrovert. So use this time to make sure you're connecting with friends and family. You're connecting with colleagues, um, host one-on-ones with people that, uh, you know, you want to get to know uh, and making those connections in a socially, you know, with the social distancing parameters that are in effect right now. Really strong, Disha mentioned this already, but limit the negative news, right? So they're like, the news is just one big cycle on repeat, 
like if you have to watch the news, watch it for 10 minutes and turn it off for the day, right? It just is gonna create a pattern of fear and scarcity and worry. So be informed, find a source to be informed, but don't be hooked into the news every day, all day. Um, I'm working on my social media consumption. That's another variation. Um, social media has this mix of like positive and then you like find something negative, right? So just limiting your exposure to negative messages is really important. Uh, and then finally embrace a leadership role. So I mentioned this at the beginning, but I really do believe that an attitude of service helps us overcome fear and scarcity thinking. It keeps us in the abundance mindset. And everyone here has something to give. The, the wisdom and the shares and the generosity just in this chat that I've been able to scan like has been absolutely amazing. So continuing to think about how can I bring that forward to my organization? How can I bring that forward to my friends and family? How can I continue to be generous with what I do have. You might have extra time. Like if you are not at home with your kids, you might have extra time right now. You might have just extra resources of some other part. So be generous with what you do have um, and it helps you focus less on what you don't have. Um, and do you think about also investing your time consciously as well? So, you know, don't put yourself on the hook for this, but, um, you know, what course could you take? What book could you read? What closet could you declutter? Uh, what are all the things that you've always said, I don't have time for? Or I read somebody's like, oh, I always said if I was, you know, I just needed two weeks to get my house in order. It's like, well, I guess I have my two weeks, right? So be thinking about where you can invest your time in a conscious way uh, to really be, uh, you know, doing something that feels productive and meaningful to yourself. Uh, because it also helps, um, just helps protect your mindset and helps you see this as an opportunity instead of just a challenge. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, we have, oh, this is a perfect one too. Um, what if I lack motivation and miss colleagues? Um, this came up from our Facebook group. And I think, you know, the connection thing that we talked about was really important, but I would really also look at what is it that motivates you? Right, and this is an opportunity to get clear on what your motivators are. Is it having your butt in the seat in your office desk or somehow you walk in that office building and you're motivated? Um, what is it about that? What's the feeling of being in that office space that is motivating you? Is it a fear-based motivation? Is it a positive motivation? Do you wanna recreate that at home or do you wanna create a different motivation that might be in better of service to you? So. All challenges are also opportunities to reflect on how is kind of my default way of being, how has it been serving me and how has it not been serving me and what new habits and patterns do I want to take this opportunity to create as well. All right, uh, and just anything you wanna to add to all of this before we answer a couple more questions here? Um, if you can go back to the to the yeah, slide about slide about protecting your mindset, these are all very very powerful uh, points. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to mention on the second one there, like focusing on the value you create, right, versus the the set number of hours that you put in. I think when you focus on value, it will actually help you maintain um, better balance because when you when you when you think that you have done a good job at work by creating value, then you would be as energized to, to perform good in your personal life. Yeah, right. I mean, you, you would have, you'd be a little bit more optimistic and you'll have um, a jump in your step. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, a that. that's a great point. And I was just scanning to see if I saw any other questions. I haven't actually seen anyone use yeah. the question thing. So I, I think we've had some great um, suggestions and yeah, great suggestions for people. There. All right, does anyone have a final question before we close things out? Lots of thank yous. Um, I saw somebody who's gonna share it with their workplace. Please do share this. Um, if it will benefit people in your organization, we will be, the YouTube video will be up immediately. And then this afternoon, I'll be posting it on the Bridging the Gap website, as well as with a summary of what we covered. So. Um, people can scan through the resources as well and incorporating what we can. Um, and I'll just say like, I am kind of like, I have this niggle of like, what's the opportunity here for bridging the gap? 
and um, I have kind of a consideration of potentially, I, won't, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew, but potentially running some sort of, you know, a coaching program or somebody who, something that for people who want to dive deeper and in, into working remotely. So if that is something that you are interested in um, over the next several weeks, uh, let me know and uh, we'll see if that idea takes shape. Uh, if not, I'm glad that we could help a ton of you uh, in this session. So uh, Kimberly says, nice to hear other people have questions and concerns. That can be, that can be a really, really powerful thing, just especially in times like this, like we think what we're experiencing is like unique to us, right? And what I've seen happen again and again when, I've, when we've curated business analysis communities is like, oh my gosh, everybody else has the same exact challenges or similar challenges or different challenges. And we feel that sense of connection. We feel that sense of not having to figure this out on our own. Um, that can be really important and really motivating as well. Okay, so some ideas here for some things that people would like to see more of. All right, awesome. Yes, we are all in this together. Thank you for that, great comment. Um, and thank you so much, Disha, for sharing so generously and great to have you on our team and as one of our coaches and I appreciate you. Thank you, Laura, for this opportunity. Yes. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will be in touch with the replay and super grateful to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.